Welcome to Real Vision Crypto. I'm Ash Bennington. I'm joined today by Taka Cato, Executive Director and Head of Sales and Trading at Bitflyer, the largest crypto exchange in Japan. Today, we talk about digital assets in the context of Japan and broader Asia. Taka, welcome to Real Vision. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, let's get started talking a little bit about your background. You had a long and distinguished career in traditional finance before you made the jump into digital assets. Sure. Uh, so after graduating college, I grew up in the U.S. Um, I moved out to Japan, um, you know, initially just to maybe for a two, three year stint, uh, kind of get in touch with my roots, um, but uh, I ended up staying a lot longer. Uh, so I started off my career uh, at Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs in Tokyo, and the progression of, I guess, uh, my career was that I started off at a equity sales role. Um, and the interesting part of that was that I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with a lot of different types of investors as they came through Japan. And so uh, uh, the, the corporate uh, culture in Japan was one that really wasn't that welcoming to shareholders at the time, but a lot of people wanted to come to Japan to uh, speak directly to management to try to get a better sense of what's going on on the ground. So I handled all the logistics and the translation uh, for a lot of investors coming into Japan. And that gave me the opportunity to meet with uh, some people such as, you know, a Steve Mandel or a lot of people at the Tiger Complex back then in the, uh, in the 90s um, and really get to spend a lot of time with them to see how they dissect companies and analyze them. So that was a great learning experience. Um, from that role, I, I moved to the execution side to get closer to the markets. So I joined the futures and execution desk. And this was the day, these days there were no algos. So a lot of execution was done manually. So I literally had to stare at the tape and, and, and press buttons uh, to you know, execute trades um, in Nikkei futures and options, for example. Uh, and that was you know, really post uh, the whole Nick Leeson uh, issues in Japan, so or in, in Asia in general. So uh, it was a very interesting period. We should say Nick Leeson was a trader at Barron's Bank, uh, who ultimately uh, played a significant role in actually bankrupting Barron's. Owen Wilson famously played in a great film, uh, if you're interested for the backstory. I have seen it. And that was, uh, it, it was a very well done movie, I thought. Um, and it gave me an opportunity to interact and see how some of the best macro traders um, uh, traded. So, you know, uh, Goldman obviously had a uh, very close tie ties with some of the biggest macro investors of the time. Um, and back then, you know, a lot of stuff was done over voice. So you, you could actually hear and see how some of these uh, you know, macro traders um, traded. And stylistically, um, again, I'd say some of the biggest names that you might see on CNBC and so on, when they're executing and you can see the styles, some of these guys, uh, it's very clear. They're very good at the turn. They kind of come in at the you know, uh, right time, push the market, and then the whole market reacts. Hey, Taka, for people who don't know uh, what it's like to sit on a trading desk, explain what that means. <laughs> Sitting on a trading desk. Um, just imagine rows of computers and you've got, you know, um, screens, which basically show, uh, mainly what we call buy kais, you know, sets of offers, sets of bids. And literally that's what a real market is. And you watch the bids and the offers obviously hit each other. Um, and you know, it, it's the very base basics of how a market works is that there is this whole notion of supply demand, you know, uh, fear and greed, panic. And you can see all that in, in motion, which is now all automated. But back then, you can actually see it in kind of real time um, on the screens as the ticks happen. Um, so I'm not sure if that's a great uh, explanation of it, um, but it's quite different than what I think most people imagine um, how markets work. By the way, I should say, it's actually Ewan McGregor and not Owen Wilson. Uh, and it's, it's called Rogue Trader, uh, the Barons, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Barings of film. Uh, so interesting enough, you've spent all of this time essentially gathering all of this experience, uh, what it means to execute trades, uh, thinking about markets from that context. How do you get interested in the crypto side? First time I came uh, by it was, I believe it was either 2012 or 13, but the FT 
I uh, ran a set of articles. I think it might have been in Alphaville, but um, talking about Bitcoin. And after reading that, I started to do a bit of work on it and take a look at it. But unfortunately, I came to the conclusion that you know the risks of China taking over and you know some of the sort of early concerns of hacking, etc., were too great um, for me to put any significant amount of money. Um, again, I should have put a bit of speculative money. Had literally talked to my wife and and, and been able to uh, get her on board with putting some savings into it. So. But unfortunately, didn't pull the trigger. And then so I kind of missed the whole first leg of the, uh, of the rally in 2017. Um, but what uh, really got me interested was uh, in 2020, uh, you may recall that, um, you know, the IMF, the BIS, et cetera, uh, all put out a bunch of papers uh, in September, October that year. And so I kind of went through that. And that's what really kind of made things click because I was looking into it. Um, but I couldn't find something to kind of get me over the line. But then when I saw the framework of the financial system that was being laid out in those papers, the time frame, et cetera, it, it clicked that the world was about to change. Um, so fortunately, as I started to get quite interested in bullish, and, and the logic behind it was slightly different, is that the framework that was being built, the bottom line conclusion was that it was going to take years to put it together. A Bitcoin was going to have an open window to run before that framework was put in place for the CBDC. So with that in mind, that was, to me, the catalyst for the breakout uh, in 2020. So as things were breaking out, I, I literally was buying the breakout. Um, and this was a year after the gold breakout. Um, uh, you know, again, gold had a, a cap at 1360 for so long. And then as soon as it broke that, it just obviously ran all the way to 2000. Bitcoin felt the same way at that point in time. Uh, so that's when I just started buying it for myself. And then I joined uh, the industry uh, the following year, but I was in discussions uh, for the right role uh, from that point. So how did you make the de uh, decision to go to Bitflyer, as we said, the largest cryptocurrency exchange in Japan? Uh, so Bitflyer was started uh, in 2014 by uh, an ex Goldman colleague. Uh, and you know he had reached out to me uh, in early 2020 to see if I'd be interested. And initially, I said, "Listen, I'll think about it," um, but I didn't quite see, uh, I didn't quite grasp the opportunity, didn't quite know enough about it to really say I'd make a career change from traditional finance to crypto. But as I kind of put some work into it and looked into it, um, you know, the markets were going to develop. I thought in in a way that was similar to digital finance. And that's definitely what we're seeing today. Um, and you know, a lot of concepts and, and ideas uh, were very similar. So again, going back to my background a bit from pure execution to then sort of fo focusing on derivatives and then macro. Uh, and then over time I joined the, uh, the macro sales team which is sort of where I ran into Raul. Um, initially, so we kind of were had a similar background. Th that's when really, when you think of it, and I guess the way he would as well, and, and I did, it was like this is going to happen, right? And this is going to be a major trend. And you and it didn't matter really how um, how regulations or any framework was going to be built. This thing was going to be fairly unstoppable it seems so i was like okay listen if you can't beat them join them uh and let and i just made the jump so so with all of that said taka give us the framework uh, how do you think about crypto markets in japan specifically i know that a lot of people here in the united states understand the importance of asia and digital asset markets but they don't understand some of the particulars tell us about the crypto markets in japan right now Okay, so uh, take a step back. Um, obviously, Japan was the biggest crypto market uh, or Bitcoin market in the world uh, back in 2017. Um, and Bitflyer at, at that point was the biggest exchange. Um, the flows were dominated by retail. So on the exchange side, our flows were roughly 70% retail. Um, so 70 plus. So literally, it was, it was very much dominated by retail and they were trading in very large size. Uh, and with leverage, and, and I think that's that's key. Um, the concept of leverage in Asia, I think, is very powerful, which is what makes the flows so much bigger in the perpetual uh, swap market. 
um, in this region. Uh, it, it's partly regulatory, but I think it's also the nature of the investor base. By the way, tell us about those perpetual swaps, because I think a lot of Americans I don't really understand that product. Um, we have two products as well, Bitflyer, which is both a perpetual type product as well as a future. Um, having come from TribeFi, uh, that, you know, you're, at least in equities, you're used to both S&P and Nikkei and everything to have a, a futures product with a fixed expiry um, and, uh, you know, a, and a convergence mechanism that's basically, you know, uh, on a three-month time frame, usually quarterly. Now, I guess what has uh, happened is that the retail-driven product, um, you know, retail aren't really in favor of kind of looking, going through the whole role process of saying on a quarterly futures product that you need to, um, you know, uh, roll your product and, and, and maintain the exposure. Whereas on a perpetual... By the way, for people who may not know, uh, what you're talking about is the futures expiry uh, process where you have to essentially come back into the product on a quarterly basis uh, to continue your exposure to it. So it has a fixed expiry date uh, and rolling that is essentially buying into the next contract. The futures positions uh, require a bit more uh, maintenance, if you will, and, and you need to ensure that you roll the product or, or maintain that exposure uh, and and go through the process of that while main, watching the economics of doing that. Whereas on a perpetual product, um, many of the uh, convergence mechanisms, which is basically the notion that the derivative product and the spot product have to have some correlation uh, and, and, and are tied together. Um, but uh, on a perpetual in that market, uh, there is a often a, a daily or you know a certain hourly cycle, um, or there's some other way to make sure that the the spread between the two doesn't uh, in, uh, grow to anything that's uh, untenable. And what's that mechanism for the perpetuals? In the perpetual swap, um, and let me I guess. Uh, we have a fairly unique product, um, which uses something called a SFD, a swap for differences, which basically is a bit of a, uh, when it goes too far in one direction or the other, there's a bit of a penalty applied to anyone trying to push it even further away from the uh, the anchor product or the Bitcoin price. Um, but many of our competitors have products which are much faster. And so on a daily cycle, either eight hours or 24 hours, even sometimes on an hourly basis, the, the product will converge. So what happens at a three month time frame uh, in a futures product, let's say on a, on a quarterly expiry, happens on a daily um, window. So again, this goes to the notion of really the derivative product and especially in crypto and why it's so fast and, and aggressive is a function I think of uh, A, the leverage that is allowed in Asia and again, Japan has changed significantly on that front. But again, in Asia, again, there's a fair amount of leverage still in the market. Um, the, the liquidation process, which basically uh, forces uh, positions that are losing uh, to be liquidated um, and automatically at a very fast rate. Um, and really, I think uh, because the markets are... Uh, disparate they're they're um i'm not sure what the right word here is is that the markets there's so many different ones that aren't necessarily connected and the arbitrage mechanisms that keep them in line can't react as fast as the actual underlying product so you have these big dislocations um between right. markets and so the fact that you have many different markets you have a lot of leverage and you have a liquidation process uh leads to these very fast, aggressive, and uh, um, derivative markets in this region, um, mainly led by uh, exchanges that are historically been China-based. Um, but uh, Japan uh, has also been a big derivatives market historically. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.